So we've got some examples here of different patents. So we've got a, a pharmaceutical product here. Uh, I'm not a chemist. I have absolutely no idea what that does or what it's for. Um, but you can protect pharmaceuticals, chemicals, methods of manufacturing, those things like that. Um, then we've got a flying car. We all want one of those. Avoid the traffic on the M1 when you come down to the Blue Box Conference. Um, unfortunately, no practical ones yet, but this is another example of something you can protect. And finally up there, we've got a patent from Apple, um, which is on a user interface for a mobile device, tablet, smartphone, whatever. So that just sort of highlights some of the different sorts of things that can be protected. In order to get protection, your idea has got to be novel, and that just means new. If all chairs in the world were blue, a black chair would be novel. It's as straightforward as that. But inventive, it's also got to be non-obvious. So clearly a blue chair would be an obvious development of a black chair. But if all chairs were like bar stools and just had something to sit on, putting a back and arms on the chair might not be obvious, you might be able to protect that. It's also got to be not excluded subject matter. And different countries have different laws around what sort of things you can and can't patent. So a fairly universal one is you can't patent methods of cloning human beings. Don't know that people would want to, but there you go. Um, but there's also things like methods of medical treatment can't be protected in some countries, and software can't be protected in some countries. Um, patents provide the exclusive right to prevent other people exploiting your idea. Uh, and this is a fairly fundamental concept. Getting a patent does not necessarily give you freedom to operate. So I could get a patent on an improved type of chair, but if somebody has an earlier patent on a basic design of chair, I may still infringe that. And I might not be able to produce my improved chair. It just means that I can stop everybody else copying my improved chair. Okay, and please feel free to stop, and ask, stop me and ask questions as we go through. So if you've got any questions on patents, let me know. Okay, trademarks. So, the purpose of trademarks is to act as a badge of origin. The whole purpose of that is to tell the customer who they are buying goods and services from. So we've got some example trademarks there, with Facebook, Google, eBay, uh, the Apple logo, and even the Coca-Cola bottle. And that's important, you can trademark quite a range of different things. So we've got names, logos, Sounds, think about the, uh, the ding, ding, ding with Intel. Uh, shapes, so shapes of the bottle. Even smells. Uh, there was a trademark in the UK for the smell of roses associated with car tyres. And the principle behind that is if you go into a tyre warehouse, you're going around looking at tyres to buy, suddenly you smell roses. It's, ah, oh, yeah, that must be that company's tyres. I don't know that it ever took off, but it's a good example of sorts of things you can trademark. To get a trademark, your trademark has got to be distinctive, and it's got to be reproducible. Uh, and that really is, is just straightforward as it needs to be something they can put on a register somewhere so everybody can look it up. Of course, that's quite difficult when it comes to things like smells. How do you define smell? The smell of roses is fairly straightforward, but when you get onto more complex fragrances, that, that's pretty tricky. Uh, trademarks also have to relate to specific goods and services. So for example, we've got Apple relating to computers and things like that. Um, but it might not be infringement to use the trademark Apple with a completely unrelated product. Lollipops or something like that. Uh, in fact, as trademarks become really well known, that changes and they can apply to pretty much everything. But that's quite an important point because trademarks can get struck off for non-use. So if you come up with a wonderful trademark and then apply it to absolutely every type of product and service, but only use it for a small subset like some computer equipment, you could be struck off, it could be struck off for you not using it to sell other things. So choosing your goods and services is quite important. Any questions? Uh, registered designs, um, that protects the visual appearance of things. So we've got the iPad, uh, even the Coca-Cola bottle. Um, that highlights an interesting point. You can get multiple types of protection on the same idea or same article. 
Um, register designs protect the visual appearance. That's a shape, configuration, pattern, or ornamentation. Uh, but it doesn't protect the functionality. So it really does just protect how it looks. So areas where things like this are used are things like sunglass designs, watches, mobile phone cases, tablets, things like that. So you can automatically see with a, an Apple tablet, you've got trademarks with Apple, you've got the registered design and the appearance, but you've also got functionality, the way the interface works, the configuration of the electronics inside it, things like that. So, multiple different types of intellectual property on the same uh, item. Uh, copyrights. So, copyright protects literary, artistic, dramatic, musical works, things like that. It protects the expression of the idea and not the idea itself. So, it won't necessarily protect the plot of a book, but it will protect the particular expression of that plot. Um, your article, your, your Creation must be an original work, so you can't have copied it from somebody else. The other key thing is no registrations required. So with patents, trademarks, and designs, you really have to register the idea with the patent office. Uh, in the case of copyright, there's no formal registration needed, although you can register it in the US. Um, but what that means is you've got to be able to prove that you created the work and when you created the work. So keeping records of creation of software, uh, various things like that, really, really important. And the other thing to know about copyright is it protects against copying. So what that means is somebody must have seen the previous work and actually gone out and copied it. If I was a hermit that had lived in a cave for 80 years and I happened to write songs that were identical to the Beatles songs, I could not be sued for copyright infringement because I had not copied them but independently create. And finally, confidential information. So this is things like the recipe of Coca-Cola, the secret herbs and spices that go into KFC. Um, confidential information is not really intellectual property in the sense that it's a, an enforceable right, but of course if you are able to keep something secret so people cannot replicate your idea, then hopefully you can charge more for it. And that's the principle of Coca-Cola. With Coca-Cola, other people cannot produce the same flavour of drink, so they can hopefully charge more for their product. You've got to be able to keep it secret, though. As soon as your idea can be uh, reverse engineered, uh, trade secrets, confidential information, is not going to be of any use whatsoever. The other thing is, you've got to put in place uh, specific mechanisms to make sure your idea is kept secret. So employees should be kept under confidentiality agreement. With Coca-Cola, they go through a whole range of different things. So there's only three people have access to the recipe. In terms of manufacturing it, they get different companies to manufacture different parts of the recipe, and then they combine it all together. So no one company has access to all the different parts. Uh, okay, so that's what IP is. Why is it important? Um, this is a, a particular sort of comic I, I like online, uh, very geeky. Um, but this really um, sums it up. Uh, I don't know, can you read it at the back? Anybody? No? Okay, so dude, I had this idea like five years ago and some company just got rich doing it. I want my cut. That's not how it works. Sure it is, I'm applying for my share now. Uh, so, fills in the form, click submit, box of money arrives. Yeah, unfortunately that's not how the world works. So that's why we need intellectual property protection. Um, as some of you may know, typical commercialization process is very, very expensive. It's not simply a case of, I've had a great idea, somebody's going to throw money at me. There's a lot of stages you have to go through to bring a product out onto the market. So there's things like feasibility studies, prototype and product development, marketing, developing manufacturing and distribution capabilities. And all of that is going to cost you a lot of money. Um, there was a study back in 2003. The cost of bringing a pharmaceutical to market is approximately 800 million US dollars. Uh, in the case of this day and age, uh, I've seen other studies, they put it at about $8 billion to bring out a new pharmaceutical, get it to market. Now obviously, a company is not going to spend $8 billion developing a product 
if the day after they release it, all of their competitors can just copy it. It's simply not cost effective. You've got to be able to recoup that investment somehow. And that's what IP is for. So how do you do that? Well, there's a number of different mechanisms for making money. You get a market monopoly. If you are the only company that can sell a particular pharmaceutical, well, great, you can charge whatever you want for it. And if it's a good product, people will pay that money. Uh, alternatively, you can license that idea out. You can say to different companies, well, you can use my idea, you can make it, sell it, do whatever you want with it. But every time you do, you have to pay me a fee. Uh, IP is also useful as a bit of a negotiation tool. If you're tendering for a contract, it's very good if you can say to the, the people, well, you know, here's our, here's our implementation of this idea, and we're the only people who can do that. It's a very attractive way of, of, uh, of, of getting engagement. Um, you can also enter into cross-licensing agreements. So if you get sued by somebody and you've got IP that they, they are going to uh, infringe, then you can use that to negotiate with them. Uh, I had a great example of this uh, in my younger days, back when I was in the UK and had hair. Um, I, had a, I worked for a small network interface card company who made cards for the inside of computers. And one day, uh, a big player uh, came and knocked on their door and said, you infringe one of our patents. And uh, for our company, that would have been it. That would have been the end of the road because they wouldn't have been able to afford to litigate and enter into a fight with them. So we went through their patents and we found 20 and we sent them back to this other company. So the other company then said, well, actually, we found these 500 you in French. Now, at that point, the two companies say, if we carry on down this path, the only thing that's going to get happen is, is our patent attorneys on our lawyers are going to get very rich. So they both said, what we'll do is we will agree to license each other. We'll let each other carry on doing what we were doing before. And away we go. So what that meant is our client was able to stand up to the metaphorical 800 pound gorilla and carry on what they were doing. And simply because they had protected their ideas. Um, it's important to understand that IP is also a, a, an asset of a company. It has inherent value. It will sit on your books as an asset. And you can use that if you are seeking investment, trade sales, things like that. So there's a, a number of different ways that IP can add value to an organization. So IP position is necessary to allow companies to recoup costs in placing a product in the market. Uh, if you're a startup and you're seeking investment, it's almost absolutely critical because investors coming along are not going to want to put money into your company unless they can see that you are going to have some competitive advantage when you get out onto the marketplace. And IP can also help maximise returns on investment. Okay, so this is the get to the bit that I don't like. Because I'm a patent attorney, I don't do trademarks. But trademarks, I'm afraid to say, are often the most valuable bit of intellectual property protection you can get. And the reason being is it's the trademark that drives the customer to buy from you. So think about Facebook. We go to Facebook because we know Facebook. It's that trademark. We don't go to Facebook because they've got lots of nice patents. Same with Google. Um, the other thing is, quite often if you get patents or registered designs, they may apply to one particular product. A trademark, however, can apply to a whole range of products. So Apple, you've got the iPhone, the iPad, the iMac, everything. People will buy them because they're all branded Apple, not because of patents that go on each particular one. So our goal should always be to try and maximize the value in a trademark, make it distinctive, and use any exclusivity you can to develop that reputation in that brand. So, for a startup company, a really good strategy is to use patents and designs as a barrier to entry, stop people competing with you, and use that period of exclusivity to grow a brand. And then you should be able to charge more for your product. I'll give you an example of this, Neurofame. This is a classic example of branding. Neurofam, ibuprofen, same thing. Absolutely identical. Ibuprofen is the, the drug, Neurofam is the brand name 
from one particular manufacturer of that drug. Um, ibuprofen was developed by Boots um, back in the 1960s. Um, they launched it in 1969. <clears throat> the patents they had lasted for 20 years, so expired in the early 80s. If you go into Coles today and you buy standard Nurofen, you're paying 4 dollars for 24 tablets. Standard ibuprofen, 3 dollars for 24 tablets. That's $1.50-ish. Well, maths isn't very good. $1.50. The value there is solely due to that. Customers will pay more for that product solely because they recognize Neurofen and they trust that Neurofen is going to get rid of that devilish hangover they've got. But in fact, the drugs are exactly the same. So how did they do this? Well, quite simply, when they had that period of exclusivity, when they were the only people who could sell ibuprofen, they were the only people who could supply that pharmaceutical, they used that to grow their brand. And their brand got known amongst customers. So when other things called ibuprofen came along, people went, oh yeah, it may be ibuprofen, but it's not Nurofen. It wasn't quite that simple, because what they also did is they used clever tactics to try and expand, extend the period of protection they got from patents. So they started off with a basic patent on ibuprofen, but then they moved along and started patenting improvements. So we've got Neurofen Plus, ibuprofen and coding, uh, Neurofen for migraine pain, Neurofen cold and flu. So they get these patents later on as their first patents are expiring. So they get another period of exclusivity in these follow-on brands, the follow-on products, sorry. And those improvements, again, they help grow the brand Neurofen. So people will still keep paying more for the basic Neurofen product, even though it's the same as ibuprofen. And that is why your trademarks are so valuable. Another example, razors. Used to be the old cutthroat. Then we had the safety razor. Then we had the many bladed safety razor. There's only so far you can take these improvements. I don't know about you, but I, I don't think I'd want to try shaving with 22 blades. But despite that, they've used this period of exclusivity on the many blades and the particular springs and all the various things to grow the brand Gillette. But not only that, they then apply Gillette to lots of other products. And that becomes very valuable. Now, the reason I've got the Duracell bunny there and Duracell batteries is because the company that owned Gillette also owned Duracell. So those two very well-known household consumer brands. Procter & Gamble purchased Gillette as a company. The whole lot, lock, stock and barrel. $70 billion. It's a lot of money. 37% of that, $26 billion in the brand names, the trademarks. That's huge, huge. Think about all that money just for the names. Very good ones. But really, what are you buying when you buy that 26 billion for those names? You're buying access to all of the customers. All of those customers, think about it, worldwide, billions. Billions of people who will pay more for your product because they recognize those names. It's important that you make sure you get things right, though. This is a classic example. Rolls-Royce, maker of fine cars. Well, they once were. Uh, Rolls-Royce engines, making of aircraft engines. <coughs> Rolls-Royce, there we go, there's the trademark, the logo. The observant among you. There it is, stuck on the side of an engine. That's quite a key point. So Rolls-Royce, the car manufacturer, um, let's face it, it, it really let things go a bit. It wasn't doing too well a few years ago. So the vultures moved in. In come the Germans, BMW, VW. Get into a bit of a bidding war. They want to buy that luxury brand. They want to be able to sell Rolls-Royce motors. <coughs> BMW bid 340 million. VW bid 430 million. VW won, hey, it was a great day. 
when they realized their lawyers hadn't done their work properly. It turns out that, yeah, they bought the car manufacturer, hadn't bought the rights to use the trademark. Ooh, BMW, their lawyers were a bit better, went off and licensed that from the aero manufacturer for $40 million. Saving themselves $390 million, they can make Rolls Royce cars. There you go. It was a bit of an error. So, you're a startup, you've got your idea. How do you go about maximizing the value? So we seek protection. We use that protection, whether it's patents, registered designs or whatever, to build a market position. Build reputation in that trademark, and then you reach. Fantastic. Look for an acquisition, partnership, ongoing development, whatever. If you've maximized the value in that brand, it's going to be a lot easier. Okay, so in a little bit more detail, you've come up with your idea, create your concept, whatever that might be, new pharmaceutical, new software app, who knows. Go out and have a look at what else is out there. And don't look at just what is in the market, but what ideas have people tried to come up with before? You know, what else have people tried to patent before? What registered designs are there out there? And then you've got to look at it and you say, well, is my idea better, cheaper, faster? Excuse me. Is it something that people are going to want to buy? And can I protect those benefits? Because realistically, if you can, you're going to be struggling. So then, feasibility study. Can I make it? Can I perform it if it's a service? You know, is it feasible for me to manufacture this in a cost-effective manner? Or is it going to cost me so much to make it that nobody will ever buy it? And will people buy it or use it? You know, you may think it's a good idea. Your mother may think it's a good idea, but that's only because she's your mother. But what about your friends? What about potential customers? Do they think it's going to be good? Are they going to be willing to pay money for it? So key questions. What is my position? Can I exploit this position commercially? Can it be protected? And I'm afraid, importantly, is this position going to make money? Because, you know, in this day and age, it, it doesn't really matter how good and altruistic your idea is, if it's not going to make money, it's going to be very difficult to actually set up and run a business around it. So, assuming you get through all of that and you're still interested, apply for protection. And this is absolutely critical. Seek protection before you disclose the idea publicly. Because once you've disclosed it, your patent's not going to be novel and inventive if you file it after disclosure. And disclosure covers everything. Use, publication on a website. Don't put it up on Facebook. Okay, no you laugh. I had somebody who spent a lot of money with us going down the patent route, uh, and then came to us one day and said, oh, I forgot to tell you, but I put my idea on Facebook a few years ago. Yeah, that's not a problem, is it? Yes, it is. Um, presentation at conferences, another good one for academics. You know, you all want to publish, we know you all want to publish, and that's great. There's nothing wrong with wanting to publish. Just make sure you file for protection before you publish. As soon as you file your patent application, by all means go off and publish it. But let's get the applications in there first. Uh, and reverse engineering. Sometimes people say, oh, well, people wouldn't have known how to do it when I disclosed. But if they could have reverse engineered it, that's a problem. Now, with all of this, it doesn't apply if there's confidentiality. So you can go and discuss your idea with people confidentially, but you must make sure that any discussions or disclosures you have are covered by confidentiality. So, once you've applied, you can start going off and looking for investment, trying to get some commercial deal. Do that as soon as possible, the day after we've lodged your patent application. Go away, start trying to make money out of it as soon as you can because costs are going to ramp up. And what you want to do is have some investment, have some ongoing revenue as soon as you can in the process so you can afford the lot of stages. Once you've got some investment, go out and develop your actual commercial product. 
you know, take it from the idea to the actual prototype and through the prototype into the manufacturing uh, version. And as you go through that, you'll come up with improvements. As you take it out to the market, you'll come up with improvements. People will say, well, that's great, but, you know, I want an extra 300 blades on my razor. Go and patent those improvements because they maybe will make it commercially successful. Next, create a brand and trademark. Now, you should have those associated with the product, but it's important to think that you may want to sell other products under that same trademark. Think about Apple. You know, they sell a whole range of products. So, don't have a trademark which describes what your product is. Once you get out onto the market, or even if you're just selling, uh, sorry, advertising, mark products, websites, and other things to say that you've got patents, to say that you've got registered designs, to say that you've got trademarks. It puts other people on notice, and it stops what we call an innocent infringer defense, which can be used to limit damages. And then keep an eye out on what your competitors are doing. And if your competitors start copying you, do something about it. Go and sue them. Go and offer them a license. So, ensure there's a protectable position. Make sure that's of commercial value. Get some protection and then leverage the value off that protection. Okay, I'm going to go through a few case studies here. So, um, Syro. I'm sure you all know who Syro are. Uh, you've probably heard of the Wi-Fi uh, case. Yeah? Well, Back in the 90s, um, Syro developed some technology which was fairly critical in making wireless networks actually practical. Um, the researchers with Syro's blessing went out and established a, a spin-out company, Radiata, and the whole purpose of that was to commercialize this technology. And they did very well. They got some investment from Cisco and everything was looking rosy. And then in 2002, lots of other companies picked up on this technology and started implementing it, putting it out in products, um, without taking a license. So Radiata went out and offered licenses to people. But I think it was very much the view, oh, you're just associated with some government down in that funny country called Australia. Ah, uh, you're never going to sue us. So we'll just copy it, be done with it. <laughs> so Syro took the very brave decision to say, we are going to sue people. 2005, they picked their first um, victim, Buffalo Technology, and they sued them in the courts in the US and an injunction was granted. Uh, from there, a couple of years later, uh, Syro have litigation pending with 14 companies, including the likes of Microsoft. Uh, they got a total settlement for, for 205 million. They then went against laptop manufacturers, Sony, Lenovo, or Acer, and then mobile companies, mobile suppliers. Um, I saw on their website the other day, they think they made about $430 million out of that patent. <coughs> so, very, very good outcome. Very good outcome. Again, that shows the value of getting out there, protecting your idea, and making some money from it. Yeah. Were they aware of that? were the, the other companies who... Yeah, sorry. I mean, if they developed the technology and all these huge companies were using it without their license. Yeah. I mean, they're not companies that are like hidden in the middle of the mountain, really. But no. Like Microsoft. <coughs> Wouldn't they be aware of it, that they've been using that after years of their patent being registered? Yeah, that, that, that's right. So that's why they went out and that's why they sued. And, and that's why the damages, uh, the agreement was, was so large. But what, what I mean is, like, did they let the technology, did they let the problem grow so they could get more benefit back? Um, yeah, no, no, it, this, this, is a, this is a really good, a really good problem. And there is potentially some wisdom in doing that. You know, if there's only one or two infringers, you're not going to make much money. If there's 20 or 30 infringers, well, a lot more money. Potentially, um, there is a principle that you 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 can't willingly let infringement happen for too long. Um, but in this particular case, um, it, it was only really 2002 that unlicensed products really came out, uh, and it was in 2005 that they first sued. 
That was three years later. So yeah, that. it's three years, but you know, running a, a patent litigation is, is not a trivial okay. issue. And they'd have to go through a lot of decision making internally, and let's face it, governments aren't particularly quick, government agencies aren't particularly quick on these things. And uh, fundamentally, one of the, the issues CSIRO had is they were about to spend a lot of Australian taxpayer money mm. on something where they're not guaranteed success. It's a bit easier if you're a private company. Um, I've got another example for you, NTP versus Research in Motion. Um, for those who don't know, RIM, Research in Motion, is actually the BlackBerry manufacturer. Uh, NTP, uh, this was an interesting uh, couple of people, really. Um, uh, essentially, this was a researcher at Bell Labs. And the researcher at Bell Labs created this concept of pushing email to a device, which had never been done at that point in time. Went along to Bell Labs and said, hey, you've got this great idea, do you want it? Nobody would want that. We're not interested in that. You, you take it, you go off and do something with it. So he went along to his patent attorney. His patent attorney went, whoa, I like the look of that. Um, tell you what, I'll do the patents for free if I can have half the company. Research went, yeah, sounds good to me. So they set up NTP. Uh, they got several US patents granted covering this concept of push email. And then obviously, uh, around 2000, that's when um, BlackBerry came out and a number of other manufacturers um, started doing similar things as well. So they offered some licenses. Um, BlackBerry, you know, well, you're just a couple of people, you know, you're an inventor and his patent attorney, you're not going to do anything about it, so they just carried on. So they sued BlackBerry. Um, 2005, the US court said, yeah, have got some patents there, those patents are valid, they're infringed. Uh, $53 million in damages, and BlackBerry's got to shut down in the US. So uh, that would have been pretty big. Um, BlackBerry appealed and tried to negotiate a license to the patents, offered $450 million. Um, the appeal failed, and so did the negotiations. Um, the outcome of that was the US courts said, well, we are going to find these patents are infringed, and BlackBerry will shut down. Now, the biggest users of BlackBerry were the US government, who sort of said, oh, you know, really, you can't do that. The government will grind to a halt. I don't know that anybody would notice that, but um, that would have been the outcome. So it, the, 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 the decision on the trial was sort of put in abeyance. Uh, at the same time as well, interestingly, BlackBerry had applied to the US Patent Office and said to the patent office, we think these patents are invalid and we'd like you to reconsider them. In the end, the judge got sick of waiting and basically said, look, I am going to shut down BlackBerry in the US. So BlackBerry were forced back to the negotiation table and finally settled on $612 million to pay NTP for licensing. Um, BlackBerry were able to continue. Uh, about three weeks after that, the US Patent Office turned around and said, oh, actually, we think three of the five patents in that all super invalid. Sorry. Um, but by that time, NTP had already got their 600 million. So they did quite well out of that. Um, but, of course, running a court case in the US is pretty expensive. If you want to sue somebody for patent infringement in Australia, you're looking at about half a million to a million dollars. Uh, the US is, is probably four or five times that. So what other alternatives are there? Well, Forgent Networks, this is a good example. Uh, this was a US company, and in the mid-80s, they were working in video conferencing technologies over phone lines. Now, as you can imagine, you can't get much in the way of data down phone line. So they had to do a lot of very clever compression algorithms to compress the video signals, get them down the copper um, networks. Um, and they had some patterns. Uh, came to the mid 90s, and of course, nobody was doing video conferencing over phone lines anymore, and the company was struggling. They got a new CEO in, and the CEO said, Look, what, what have we got in the cupboard? Uh, open it up, Ooh, we've got a pattern, what's this? Have a look at it, it's covered JPEG compression. Wow, that's fairly big because JPEGs are used by a lot of people. But they didn't have enough money to sue anybody. It was a bit of a risk for them to sue people because you know there's a lot of big players in there who could tie them up in court until they ran out of money. So what did they do? 
they approached small companies and offered them a cheap in perpetuity license. So, hey guys, you're using JPEG. We've got a patent on JPEG. Uh, give us ten thousand dollars, we'll go away. And uh, companies look at it and go, "Whoa, well, I'm not sure whether that's valid or not." Go to the patent attorney. How much to review this? Twenty thousand dollars. There you go. There's your ten thousand. We'll take the license. And gradually, over time, they build up a bit of a war chest. Uh, and they use that as leverage against some of the bigger companies. So then they'll approach a slightly bigger company. You know, oh, your license is twenty thousand dollars. You're a bit richer. Your license is 50,000, your license is 100,000. Um, by mid 2005, I, I think they've breaked in somewhere around 200 million US dollars uh, on the basis of this. Um, so, yeah, not a bad business model. Um, but what, what that has led to, uh, and one of our audience members will have an interest in this, um, is patent trolls. <laughs> that is, people who are out there and acquire patents and go around suing people. Here we go, patent trolls. If you can't read it at the back, my brother became a patent troll. He now lives under one of those uh, billion dollar fancy suspension bridges. So what are patent trolls? Well, essentially patent trolls are what we call non-practicing entities. So they do not manufacture anything, they do not sell anything. What they do is they acquire IP. They might make it internally, they might buy it. And then they use that IP to go out and sue people who are in the marketplace and try and make money out of it. And there's a number of different tactics. So NTP, in effect, were one of the first patent trolls. They went out, they sued people, they made a lot of money, 612 million, I wouldn't mind that myself. Um, and in that particular case, they actually ran a litigation. Now obviously if you've got a patent attorney as part of your company, it's a bit cheaper to do that. If you forge it networks, you don't have a patent attorney on board, you have to pay the lawyers, well, you maybe negotiate licenses, things like that. But because they're not manufacturing anything themselves, you can't sue them back. So these patent trolls are very sort of, it's very difficult to do anything against them. And the other thing is that in the US, it's quite cheap to actually file a lawsuit. It might be quite expensive to take it all the way through to trial, um, but quite often companies don't want to become embroiled in a lawsuit because that can take up time and money for them. So particularly the smaller companies, if they get sued by a patent troll, they've got a, a real question of, well, is it commercially viable for us to fight this? Or do we just agree a license fee with them which may end up being cheaper than running a lawsuit even if we ultimately win? Um, what was an even bigger problem was the US had this concept that you could sue multiple parties in one lawsuit. So I could watch one lawsuit and name Microsoft and IBM and Adobe and Sony and whoever I wanted to. So it became very easy for these non-practicing entities to file lawsuits against multiple companies and some would settle. Some might take it all the way through and fight it, but as long as some settled, these patent trolls would keep making money. So they've got a very bad name for themselves. Um, and in some respects, um, quite reasonable as well. Um, it's been made harder. So last year, the US um, changed the laws. And it, it's now much harder to name multiple parties in one lawsuit. So it's now a lot more expensive for patent trolls. They have to file multiple lawsuits. So that's helping a bit. But it's also important to understand that um, not all patent trolls are necessarily bad. If you are a sole inventor and you come up with a wonderful idea and take it along to big companies and say, hey guys, you know, wonderful idea, do you want to buy this from me? They might look at it and go, no, not really. We'll just copy it. What are you going to do? Are you going to sue us? You don't have the money to sue us. And that's where patent trolls actually can be quite good. If you're a sole inventor, you can go to a patent troll and say, well, here, why don't you buy the patent from me and then you can use it to sue. Um, so it's interesting, they get a lot of bad press and I would suggest that um, potentially patent trolls have had quite a big impact on commercialization of innovation in the US. Um, but then on the other hand, if you're a very small company who cannot afford to litigate, it's possibly one of the only avenues you've got. There are other options, of course. You can try licensing to or, or selling your patent to a competitor or somebody who's in the market various things. 
Um, but that's where the issue of patent trolls comes from. It's interesting to consider, Alistair, that if you look at those non-practicing entities that create their own English from what we and or require a mile away, out of the top 25 largest NPEs globally, SARA was on the list. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, would you class SARA as a patent troll? They actually do develop their technology, it's just they don't actually commercialise it themselves. So they're not actually out there selling it themselves. Um, they set off right, they set up Radiata, which was a spin-out company in the case of, of Wi-Fi. Um, but yeah, and you're exactly right, I mean, all the, the patent trolls were all getting all this bad press and everything like that, and then you look at who's on the list and you sort of go, well, sorry, right, well, you know, they spent, they spent hundreds of, you know, millions of dollars developing this technology that everybody blatantly went and copied. Uh, they should be allowed to sue. That's the whole point of the patent system. How much do you, does that affect then? Because that process increase the cost of commercialization, like the patent troll lawsuits or being tied up in that? Well, uh, certainly, um, if you get targeted by a patent troll, that, that's a problem. Uh -huh. um, but the reality is, for startup companies, it's, it's a fairly small issue. And the reason it's a small issue is you're not actually making enough money to, to make it onto their radar. So it, it's only when people start making a big amount of money that that's when the lawsuits really start to fly. I mean, you know, Facebook's a classic example. It's only when Mark Zuckerberg's a millionaire that the um, Winkle boss twins came out of the woodwork and said, oh, actually, that was our idea, we want a hard cut. Um, if he was living in a cardboard box somewhere, I'm sure they wouldn't have been suing him for 40% of that. Um, there's also, there are mechanisms you can sort of use to help your position as well. So you can get IP insurance, uh, and that will cover your costs if you are taken to court. Um, now, it's not cheap, but obviously it can be cheaper than getting sued. Um, but these are all things you have to take into account when you're, you're going through that commercialization process. And you might need to factor that into the cost of your product. So if you are in a particularly litigious space, you know, if you are going to design and manufacture and sell a new smartphone, for example, you are going to need to factor that into the cost of the phone and charge more for the phone. So that if you, well, not if you get sued, when you get sued, talk about smartphones in a bit, but when you get sued, you, you've got the resources to then address them. I guess there's also an argument for efficiency that come with patent aggregators as well, and just giving another example of the story, that um, if you look at some sectors, particularly in ICT, where, I don't know, how many patents in a smartphone these days, up to 600? Oh, way, way more than that, way more than a that. A very large number. Yeah, um, I've got some figures. Well, there's a good example actually out of the state's uh, home automation company called Nest that was set up by the um, team that created the iPod and Apple. They went and left Apple and set up Nest. They sold it for a few million dollars just recently. And they, um, in order to get a number of rights that they needed to, to take their products to market, they approached a very large aggregator called Intellectual Ventures. And in one transaction, were able to acquire rights to many thousands of patents that were actually required to, to take their product to market, versus the sheer cost of going around if they won't fall in by the one party of negotiating licenses for several thousand bits of intellectual property, which would take a lot longer and, and potentially cost a lot more. So yeah. um, it, it's an interesting area because there's a lot of um, a bad elements, I think, of what's coming through in patent aggregation, but also some um, positive elements as well. And so it's, it's a bit of a mixed bag, perhaps. It, it, it is, it, totally. And um, unfortunately, I think there's a lot of, um, shall we say, biased reporting in the press. Uh, it, it quite often looks at the negatives and doesn't look at the positives. Right. It doesn't look at the poor, impoverished inventor who can't afford to sue but cannot, you know, uh, put an agreement in place with a, a patent troll or, or a non-practicing entity, as we should call them, the <laughs> being us. Um, so, yeah, there are there are two sides to it. And it, it's important that you understand that and have a balance view. Okay, so, um, what are some things you can do if you are interested in a startup or have an idea? Um, firstly, maintain detailed records of research, okay? Um, this is really important for a number of reasons. Um, to prove 
later on that you invented the idea or which individuals were, were involved in inventing the idea because that will affect who owns the idea. Um, you might need it to prove that you were working on something to give yourself a prior user defense if somebody else happens to file a patent application or something similar around the same time. You might need it to prove a date of creation in terms of copyright. Uh, so there's a whole range of reasons. Ideally, you should use lab notebooks, which are hardbound books, with each page being signed, dated, and actually countersigned. So you should not have something which looks like my accounts, which I give to my accountant. My accountant hates me. As patent attorneys, if you turn up with something like that, we'll hate you. That's how it works. Um, sure. What about only trying versions like Google Docs? Where the um, courts are struggling to get to grips with electronic documents, and the reason is it is so easy to change dates on it. So if, if you rock up to the court with a lab notebook which has each page signed, dated, and countersigned, it's incredibly unlikely that you've sort of knocked that up the night before, you know. Whereas uh, an electronic document dated 20, you know, 08, well, I, I could have change the date on my PC, resaved it. Bam. Yeah, there are things you can do to prove dates, um, but it, it's just that they are really struggling to get to grips with that. Um, obviously, you could do things like uh, burn it to a DVD with a, a hash and date stamp and things like that. Um, that's great. Um, but alternatively, if you can print things out as, as evidence of dates and use that in some sort of combination. Yes. On a further note, what about commercially available, um, like say, expenditure lab manual um, and inventory integration software? So, because I'm an idiot at the moment, we're trialing a new um, integration software where we're integrating digital lab manuals okay. um, into our purchasing and inventory system. How would something like that work, commercially available lab manuals? I've absolutely no idea, to be honest. We'd have to have a look yeah. at that. I don't know if you've looked at that. Um, so, so Bloodbox is actually funding a trial, I think, that was really included in um, some new electronic research and electronic software that's come out. And I guess to distinguish from where else was pointing to before in terms of using more mainstream electronic forms, these software packages that are emerging now are putting in a number of mechanisms um, to try to provide more you know, credibility and, um, mm. and authenticity um, to how an electronic tag is actually occurring. So I don't know, given their relatively new installing trial, I don't know how much case laws are in terms of their usability and... Yeah, I, I, I think there probably wouldn't be, but it, with all of these things, it's all about how much evidence you can put together. Um, so obviously something like that um, is going to be much better than you just saving a file onto your desktop into the data. Um, so it, it's all about as many things as, as you can put together. And obviously, if necessary, you could stand up in court and testify that, yes, you genuinely created that. That would help as well. Um, other things, formalizing ownership. Um, so this is really important. Do this early on before there's any money on the table. Um, make sure those people that have contributed to an invention and are inventors, uh, make sure that's recognized, and make sure that you have uh, assignments in place with them so if you're setting up a company that company owns things it's much easier to do that at an early stage when there's not a huge value associated with the company uh, once there's a lot of money involved you'll find that people's recollection of what happened and how much they contributed is um, perhaps uh, not accurate anymore should we say um, budgeting um, if you are a startup uh, it's really important to budget, particularly uh, intellectual property costs. They can be quite expensive. Um, so there's a few things you can do. Uh, defer costs where possible. Uh, so there are mechanisms, there are approaches to the patent strategy which can help defer costs. Uh, avoid unnecessary costs, so you know, respond quickly, instruct quickly. Uh, get external funding. Uh, and, and sensible countries, you know, if you come to me and say I want to patent my idea throughout the world, I can, the only thing I can guarantee is that you're going to go bankrupt. Uh, I'm going to go and buy my desert island. Um, so you really, you, you do need to think about things and, and look at, you know, where's the money? What are the primary markets for this product? And make sure you protect those primary markets. So, keep records of research and development. 
seek protection before you disclose your idea. Make sure you get agreements in place with anybody who's been involved in the developments. And then use your monopoly that you get from your patents and designs to develop your branding and trademark um, value. Uh, and just finally, uh, an example of how bad things can get, uh, smartphone wars. Um, this is a very, very high level summary of some of the litigation that's occurring uh, in the US and other countries. So you can see a whole range of different players. Uh, Apple features quite prominently, um, more recently, uh, Google and of course Samsung on, who are on the next page. Um, this is a, a wonderful uh, diagram somebody did a, a, a couple of years ago of all the various different litigation and it's got even more complicated since then. So everybody's suing everybody else. <laughs> the lawyers are doing very well out of this. Um, some examples of deals, uh, Rockstar Consortium, yay. Uh, Apple and a few other companies, they clubbed together, bought Nortel's patents, 6,000 patents, so I think your number of a few hundred was a little bit low there, Brent. 4.5 billion they paid for those. Um, HTC, uh, they were originally a, a hardware manufacturer, they'd gone into making their own phones. They, they came to the game late, they needed some patents, so they went out and bought 235 from this, this free graphics company. Uh, and then along came Google, and Google had nothing, really had a, quite an anti-patent stance in their early days. Um, got into Android and suddenly realized that uh, they were just going to get sued out of existence if they weren't careful, so they, they bought over 2,000 patents from IBM. And then acquired Motorola Mobility uh, for $12.5 billion, um, stripped out the patents and, and sold what was left. So, um, wow, just unbelievable amounts of money. Well, what was um, interesting with Rockstar was how long they stayed anonymous for, for I think, for quite a long period of time. People had no idea who this Rockstar was talking about. Yeah, that, that's right. And, and it was interesting because Google um, tried to buy those patents as well. So it was sort of Google with, yeah, yeah, we're going to buy all these patents. And then along came this Rockstar <laughs> consortium. Nobody knew who it was. And all of a sudden they sort of, you know, four and a half billion for these patents. And then it turns out, well, you've got Blackberry, Sony, Apple in there, you know, some pretty big names. Um, Microsoft, you know, they've got some patents that cover various features in Android, so they've done a, a whole heap of licensing deals, they'll make a bit of money out of that. Um, and then, um, yeah, some, some various outcomes there, so uh, some of the cases are now being resolved and, and people are having to, to reach commercial deals and things like that. And we have Apple and Samsung. Uh, and uh, uh, as it is at the moment, I think Apple's being awarded about two billion in damages um, from Samsung. Um, but then I've also spoken to people who said, well, realistically, um, if Samsung had spent two billion dollars on marketing, they wouldn't have got as much exposure as they have through through all this litigation. So in fact, the litigation's probably been of, of value to them, even though they've lost. But you have to sort of think about things uh, in those terms. And of course, Samsung now are suing Apple back, and you know they are getting some decisions in their favor. So um, yeah. So wow. Uh, IP can assist in commercialization. Honest. Um, patents, registered design protection should be sought before public disclosure. I really want to reiterate that it is important. You should get trademark protections for any names, logos. Um, but the bottom line is, I'm afraid, it, it's pretty complicated. Um, so, you know, according to Dilbert, uh, all future ideas are already covered by over general patents. So the best strategy is to get out and become a, a patent or trademark attorney. Um, but uh, according to Calvin and Hobbes, it's not going to make you an interesting person. That's it. Any questions? Can you tell us a bit more of which kind of protection that there are for ultimate and software? You say copyright. Um, I, I know that there are patents that particle cover algorithmical idea cover the software, yes. Although apparently you cannot do that, but they okay. go around machineries with memories and the physical hard disk and then what they describe is actually an algorithm. Yeah. Okay, so um, the question was, I, I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it was, how can you protect software, essentially? 
Um, so a number of countries have exclusions that say you can't protect software per se. Um, but in fact, you can get around those exclusions by saying that when I run the software on a computer system, it does actually achieve something. And now the uh, jurisdictions like Europe, uh, China, um, are very anti-software patents. Um, but even in countries like that, if you are achieving some improvement in the operation of the computer, or you're achieving some transformation of physical data, that's okay. Um, so things like compression algorithms, image analysis, encryption, um, more uh, efficient um, processing on computers, things like that, very, very patentable in those jurisdictions. Um, in Australia and the US, it's a lot more liberal. So as long as you can show that the implementation on the computer is not trivial, again, patentable. Um, you also get copyright protection in software. Uh, now, with software, the issue with copyright protection is it really protects it like a story. You know, it really is the actual code you write and not the functionality behind the code. So what that means with software is somebody can look at the functionality you provide, go away and write their own code, and you can't sue them for copyright infringement. Now, if somebody actually takes your code and starts selling that, then you can sue them for copyright infringement, but it's very limited. So where possible, you do want to look at trying to get both copyright protection and patent protection. Um, but obviously, you also have to think about the fact with software, um, particularly if you're working in the app space, um, apps can be uh, quite low margin. And by the time you've sort of sunk a lot of money into the patent system, um, you probably sort of destroyed any margin you've got anyway. So um, with apps, if you come up with a, an important concept that can be applied you know, quite widely, then yes, maybe patents are worthwhile. Um, but otherwise, maybe focus more on, on building a good brand. So think about Angry Birds, for example. I mean, they, they didn't have any patents on that. Um, but they built a very good brand in Angry Birds, and it's now on T-shirts and soft toys and all these various things. So they've still made a lot of money out of it. Um, but if you, you software is doing something uh, that's you know sort of non-trivial, um, you know, it's not just a game or, or you know something like that. Then yeah, definitely worth looking at. Um, unfortunately, there's no easy answer. So the best thing is probably to have a chat with somebody like me. Yeah. Any other questions? We've got a little bit more time allocated for Alistair. If there are any more questions, and that can not just be patent related, but um, copyright or artist design, trademark. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much we touched on the innovation at Alistair. Is that worth mentioning? It's not something that we typically pursue a lot, but um, often the question comes up, and yeah, you know, what is it? Yeah. So. Um, Australia uh, has a second tier level of protection, which is something known as an innovation patent. So my focus on patents has been very much on standard patents. So these are something which lasts for 20 years, and your idea has to be novel and it has to be inventive. Uh, in Australia, we have the second tier level of protection. It only lasts for eight years, but your idea only has to be novel and innovative. Um, now, what innovative is, is essentially, as long as your idea is novel, and that novel feature has an impact on the way in which the idea works, and that is considered innovative. So it can be a very small incremental change, but as long as it's a fairly functional change, that can be enough to secure innovation patent protection. Um, and even though it's only eight years, uh, for a lot of products, that, that is the product life cycle. So it can still be very valuable. Um, so even if you don't know if your idea will meet this sort of inventive threshold, um, then the innovation pattern is something you can look at as well. So uh, I, I, I guess the key thing to take away from that is there are a number of different options available. Um, so it's worth talking to us about those if, if you've got an idea and you, you're sort of not sure about whether it might be Is that Australian only? It is. Um, some countries have equivalents. So China, for example, has a utility model. Um, that can only be used to protect devices and not methods. Um, but again, it's a very similar sort of uh, protection. Question at the back? I was just going to say, what would be an example of something that used in the industry? So there was a, um, 
And a good example of it was uh, a roadside barrier. So I don't know whether you know, you get the roadside barriers that are like a, a pole which is black and white stripe. And you know, just to warn you that there's a cliff coming up and don't drive over it. Um, originally, those have been manufactured and they're, they're actually set in the ground in rubber. And the idea of that is that if you drive into it at low speed, it will, it will bend uh, and then straighten up and obviously they don't have to spend money replacing it. Um, and a company came along and they replaced the rubber by basically having a bit of spring steel that connected the pole into the ground. And it functioned in exactly the same way. You know, you drove into it at low speed, it would bend, you'd move the car away, flip back up, and, and it, was, it was all okay. Uh, and that is an interesting case, because that has actually been before the courts, and the patent was upheld. And they said, well, um, using spring steel was novel compared to using rubber to set it into the ground. Um, it would have been a fairly obvious thing to do, um, but it's novel, and the novelty had an impact on the way in which it worked, so that was up there. So that was an innovation plan. But a, a, anything like that, where you have a small incremental development in your product, is um, something you might look at an innovation plan. Um, the other area where we're using innovation patents is actually to sue people. Um, because the innovation patent only needs to be novel and innovative, they are very, very hard to revoke in terms of showing that somebody else has done it before, because you, you have to find something identical. Um, with patents, the entire patent process can take five, even ten years. Um, so as long as you've got an application pending, you can split off an innovation patent in Australia. So we might have a, a main patent going through, it's still at the patent office being assessed, somebody starts infringing, we split off an innovation patent, we get that granted very quickly and then we can take people to court and use that. And it, it leaves our original patent application going through. Yeah. Um, Having never been through the process in a patent perspective, could you give us a bit of a, an insight as you, you just did then in terms of, you know, the, the process of yeah. applying for a patent? Sure. And, you know, apart from, you know, aside from just sort of phoning you up and kind of going, we want to have a patent. <laughs> yeah. and, 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 you know, roughly costs. I know yeah. your costs, I mean, you know, if it's five years, it'll cost you $10,000, all that sort of stuff. Okay. So um, the first stage is you file what's known as a provisional application. That's a way of sticking your flag in the sand saying, as of this date, I've had this idea. The provisional application's got to describe your idea in enough detail to allow somebody else to go away and implement it. That's the, the basic fundamental requirement. It doesn't have to have all the legal claims which define scope of protection, but it is much better if it does have all of that in. Um, the cost of that provisional, it's $110 government fee, and then it's our fees in drafting it. And it really is the absolute critical part of the process because if you get that wrong, you will have nothing. Um, it will typically cost us between four and eight thousand dollars to prepare and file one of those, um, depending on the complexity of the idea. If it's a really, really complex one, it might be even more. Um, that provisional lasts for 12 months. At the end of that 12 month period, you file a complete application. And you've got to file either in each country of interest, or you can file what's known as an international application. Uh, that international application um, actually covers, uh, here we go, all of those countries. So it's actually 148 countries. So you can see it's, it's all the ones in blue, not the ones in grey. Um, <laughs> so it covers most of the countries in the world. Um, and that sort of defers the need to actually choose the individual countries by a further 18 months. The cost of the international applications, it's around ten to $12,000 if you file it through us, uh, and it's about five to $6,000 of that are actual official government fees. When you've lodged the international application, the patent office will look at it and say, we think your idea is novel and inventive or isn't novel and inventive for these reasons. So they'll actually do a search primarily of earlier patents uh, and see what they, what they find and give you an opinion. Uh, it's not binding, uh, and you can obviously respond and argue against that or, or just leave it in place until you get to the national stage. Um, you go to the national stage at 30 months from your earliest priority date. You've gone down this international path. 
And that's where you absolutely must choose your countries. So you have to file a separate application in the US, China, Japan, Australia, Europe. Europe's actually a, a single application for multiple countries. Um, and then, yeah, it's, it gets examined by each patent office separately. Uh, and the length of time that takes just depends on patent office workloads. So I've actually got a case um, I fought back in 2002 and the US recently got in touch with an opinion on that. So that was, that was good of them to get back to me in a timely manner. Um, it's, it's not a major problem. If somebody starts infringing while your patent's still going through the process, they can still be liable for damages. You can still negotiate a license and deal with them. And in most countries, you can actually write to the patent office and say, hey, look, somebody's infringing. Can you speed things up, please? There's usually mechanisms for that. Um, while an application's pending, though, you can, you've got a lot of flexibility over the scope. So in, in actual fact, it makes it much, much harder for your competitors to work out a way around the patent. Because if they sort of change a little thing and try, try and go over here, you can alter your patent and try and cover what they're doing. And once it's filed, is it then in the public domain? Yeah, it publishes 18 months after you first file. So you can launch that provisional. The provisional won't publish, but about six months after you file your complete applications, so that's when it first publishes. So when you file the provisional, if you file in Australia, somebody can see your name and a title, and that's it. Um, in some countries, they can't even see that. But the actual content only publishes at 18 months. Um, going back to the sort of the overall costs, uh, for Australia, you're looking at about twelve to 15000 to get it granted over the sort of four to five year period. Uh, after four years, you have annual renewal fees, which start from about 500 a year and go up to 1500 as you get to in 20 years. That's sort of on a sliding scale. Um, for the US, um, it's more expensive. Uh, it will be anywhere from 30000 upwards. And the reason it's hard to put a, an upper threshold on that is it, it just depends on how recalcitrant the examiners are. Uh, you will sometimes get examiners who just say, I'm not going to allow this no matter what your arguments are, how good they are. And you can get into several rounds of argument with them which can, can really ramp the cost up. Um, and as well, it depends on how far you want to push it and how broad you want your patent. If you're quite happy to have a very narrow patent, it's cheaper because you can just restrict down very early on and get very few objections. But generally, you want to argue for something as broad as you possibly can. Um, Europe's a single collective application process, um, covers about 27 countries. Uh, the filing of that's about 14,000. Prosecution is typically, yeah, same order of magnitude, maybe a bit more. And then you pay a fee for each country you validate in. Um, other countries, if you go into Japan or China, you've also got to pay translation costs as well. So the costs will ramp up very quickly if you choose a lot of countries. And um, um, you mentioned China. Yes. You know, world's probably most exciting marketplace, but also you know, we, there's, a, we, there's a few myths about um, you know, patents yeah. in China. China. China's very interesting. Um, there is actually more patent litigation in China than any other country in the world. A lot of people don't realize that. 95% of it is between Chinese entities only. Um, but having said that, um, non-Chinese companies are now suing more and more in China and doing so successfully. Um, there are pros and cons to litigation in China. The biggest pro is it is really cheap. Um, so it, it's probably a tenth of the cost of litigating a patent in somewhere like Australia. Um, Conversely, your damages awards are usually a lot less. Um, the other issue with China is um, really one of uh, the nature of manufacturing over there. Um, China typically has hubs that specialize in different industries. So there's one area which specializes in medical devices, and another area does something else. Um, and what you will find is, is the entities will work quite closely together. So if a factory gets an order and it can't meet, Go and knock on the factory next door again. Well, can you knock some of these out for us? Fantastic. Um, but what that means is they're quite flexible in terms of manufacturing. So if you sue somebody and shut them down, another factory might open up very quickly in the same thing. Um, so it, it's, it's feasible to sue and get 
get injunctions and get damages in, in China. It's becoming even more feasible to do so. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean you can always stop manufacturing occurring in China. Now, if your main market is outside of China, well, you can look at protecting the main market. So if the US, for example, is the main market and the uh, products being manufactured in China and exported into the US, getting a US patent means you can stop the importation into the US. So that might be a better solution. Uh, but it's also important to bear in mind that 30, 40 years ago, China had no sort of IP system at all. They have come a long way in that 30, 40 years. A hell of a long way. You know, they have really, considering how long they've been going at IP, a very, very sophisticated system. And if you apply for a patent now, 20 years' time, you're going to be coming to the end of its lifespan. So if you think about how far they've come in that period of time and then extrapolate forward, um, it, it is going to be very important to have IP protection in China moving forward. Um, but yeah, just don't expect it to be uh, quite as powerful as it is maybe in, in Western countries at the moment. Great. Just to contextualise um, some of the costs that Alistair mentioned, I guess a few points. One is that for intellectual property owned by QUT or assigned uh, to QUT, um, Blue Box managers that makes decisions on all the intellectual property protection, which have a budget to, um, to finance that protection. A lot of things that we're looking at though are um, typically from, from day one that we think we're protecting something, us thinking 30 months ahead and working out well, where are we going to be in 30 months? Because almost always, not always, but almost always, we try to license out or shut down a disclosure before it gets 30 months because of the sheer amount of cost involved in going into every individual country. Um, and so we're thinking, how do we get that innovation into a position where it could go to a company within 30 months of filing? In some cases, that might actually result in us delaying in applying for English property protection because we can't see a pathway getting there within 30 months, but if we do a few more things over the next 6 or 12 months and then start the process, then we can see feasible things to, to get to that point. Um, but I guess the other thing too to note is that um, despite the fact that something might be technically protectable and you, know, you can spend money protecting it, obviously we're also asking the question, is it worth protecting? Mm -hmm. I also made a good point about some of the apps and, and you know, whether in that sector, the factors are such that it, it may not be warrant going in that particular mode of protection. Um, and so, obviously, some of our questions are also around is there some of the questions Tim was asking is there a market? How big is it? What are people going to pay in that market? And again, is it, is it going to warrant it? We also look at the obviously the countries. You know, it's mentioned a number of the countries there, but and we're quite selective in looking at which countries make sense. Often, in some of the life science areas, you want as many as possible, that's got a similar um, issue and, and you want to protection to, um, to suit the high and the cost that goes in. Others, though, it might be um, more than reasonable just to have a position in the United States. Mm. That, mar that market might be large enough to make protection in that country worthwhile. So, you know, a lot of factors to consider in that sense as well. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit about registered designs and uh, how successful they can be, or yeah, they're like that. Yeah, sure. Look, um, registered designs are a very good where there is going to be exact duplication of the appearance of your product. Um, so, uh, particularly if you, you're going to pay a lot of money to get a mould made, and you're worried that the manufacturer who is churning out product for you might use that mould that you've paid for and use it to produce extra goods on the side and then sell those into other markets. Really, really useful for that sort of thing. Um, but it's a very limited form of protection. Um, so you can circumvent it by changing even very small aspects of the design. Um, so yeah, really when you know there's going to be direct reproduction or if people are paying a lot of money because of the appearance of your article, really powerful. Otherwise, not so good. Um, I know when I first started in the profession, um, I had to go along with it. It was pre everything being on the internet those days, as all people will testify to. Uh, I actually, when I was doing design searches, I had to go to the British Library and look through a card index. And I think it was like the 20th of all UK registered designs for Swatch watches. Uh, and they used to just get a registered design on every single design they came up with. 
So it really, did, it just stopped anybody copying anything similar to that. Um, but the other big ones are things like Oakley sunglasses. I know they have a lot of registered designs for, for the appearance of those. And I think in that sort of field where people will pay quite a bit extra money because of the way an article looks, it can be quite valuable. Um, but if people aren't too bothered about how it looks, it's not so worthwhile. And it really does have to be almost direct copying in order for it to be, um, yeah. So the case where a form is very, is very functional to the product, it could be very powerful. Well, uh, there, are, there are limits on, if, if the shape of your article is dictated solely by function, then you can't get a registered design for it. Um, there's also been a lot of case law on things like spare parts. Uh, so if you have a, uh, something like a car wing mirror, and the shape of that is really to fit into the shape of an overall design, you can't actually get protection on the individual components. Um, because it would stop people, you know, selling spares, and then obviously you could get hold and or somebody like that abuse their position and, and charge you five thousand dollars for a wing mirror, so that you can replace each wing mirror on your car when you ding it, that sort of thing. So there are a lot of limitations around that, where it's a very functional um, design. Um, so yeah, you, you've got to look at that carefully, and, and we could advise on that sort of thing on a case by case basis. But I, I think really you've got to look at it and say, well, are people going to be paying more for this because of the aesthetics, not the function? Okay. Can we uh, talk about it? Or? Yeah. Okay. Well, um, thanks very much.